And First Peter chapter 3. Many, many years ago, and I can say that now because I'm older. I've got a lot of years behind me, unfortunately. <laughs> or maybe that's better because I'm getting closer to heaven, so that maybe it's a good thing. Uh, but anyway, all I know is this. My uh, old model needs a little bit of WD-40 and some oil nowadays, but I got a trade-in model coming someday, and that one's not going to rust. I can't wait to receive that new trade-in model, right? So a number of years ago, I officiated at a wedding uh, out in Elgin, Illinois, west of here, as you know. And uh, I'm in the habit, when I do weddings, uh, of making sure, for lack of a better word, that the knot is tied first before I sign the marriage license. It's just a practice that I have because uh, you've probably seen enough movies where somebody gets cold feet and they walk away from the altar and, I can't do this, and they leave, right? So I don't want to sign it prematurely, so I wait till the end. Of course, you're familiar, you're from Chicago, and you're familiar with Elgin, and the county lines are kind of a little different over there, right? So when this uh, wedding service was over, I went to sign the marriage license, but to be honest, I didn't really check, I didn't even think about checking what county we're in. And so as I read the instructions, I was about to sign, here's what the instructions said, this marriage license is effective only in Kane County. The wedding ceremony must not be performed in any other county. So I thought, whoa, I better check. Are, are we in Kane County? And they said, yeah, we're in Kane County. Don't worry about it. Whew, okay. Otherwise, it's a do-over, right? Well, I remember it was probably about three, four days uh, after that wedding, I came across a news article, believe it or not, and here's what it said. It was like deja vu all over again. Here's how it reads. Uh, it says, uh, Mary Campbell of Elgin, Illinois, had to say I do three times, <laughs> count them, three, at three separate wedding ceremonies before she finally became Mrs. Randy Peterson. Now, what happened? Well, the couple took out their marriage license in Kane County, but the church was in DuPage County. That's a nightmare. I mean, even for the preacher, that's a nightmare. Therefore, the ceremony did not count because it violated Kane County's laws. A county is not pleased when people do not submit to its laws. That's just the way it is across our land, and that's actually a good thing if the laws are good, right? So they packed up the wedding party and moved on to Lord's Park on the eastern edge of Elgin. Now, if they're in Lord's Park, they've got to be blessed, right? Lord's Park, you can't go wrong there. There, they were married a second time in the tree-shaded park. Good enough, right? Well, wait a minute now. A sharp-eyed copy editor at the Elgin Courier News was reading a report on the wedding when he noticed another problem. The park, technically, is in Cook County. 200 feet from the Kane County line. Wow, close, but no cigar, as they used to say. It just didn't work, because they were still technically outside of Kane County. So again, the ceremony in Lord's Park violated the lordship of Kane County's laws, and so no good. They were not pleased. Finally, a third ceremony took place at a highly romantic spot, the newsroom of the Courier News. <laughs> And uh, they checked and found out that it was a good mile inside Kane County this time. So because both spouses submitted to Kane County's laws, the county was pleased to honor that marriage license. Praise the Lord, right? You see, Kane County is pleased when both spouses submit to the marriage laws instituted by Kane County. Now, you know your Bible well. You know that God instituted marriage. There's no dispute here, right? We're Bible believers. Not only did God create marriage and design it, if you will, and its intended purpose is to be a blessing, not only to the couple, but to family members and society. It really is, in my view, the fabric of society. If you want to get a read on the stability of a culture, just measure the family units and you'll see what's going on. If they dissolve, society crumbles, right? Not only that, Jesus blessed marriage by his presence at the wedding in Cana, you know, John chapter 2, right? So God is pro-marriage for sure, and he knows how it works at its optimum. And so I think it's wise to ask this question, and that is, when is God pleased with a marriage? And we're going to see in this text very clearly that God is pleased when both spouses, yes, both spouses, submit to Christ's lordship. 
That's when marriage is working at its best. God is pleased when both spouses submit to Christ's lordship. Now, some of you, whether here or watching via the internet, uh, may be single and may be wondering, you know, uh, yeah, this is a marriage message, it's great, but my intent is to remain single. And I, you know, how's this gonna help me? Well, is part of your intent or your plan to be a blessing to those friends of yours and family members who are married? If so, you might wanna know some of these principles. Beyond that, I would say, the principles we're going to learn here are really relationship principles, and they work across the board in any relationship. We're gonna look at context in a minute with regard to relating to employers, other people in society, et cetera. So I'm gonna invite you to tune in, um, and if you're single and likely to get married, God willing, at some point down the road, if that's the case, this is what I call prep. You know, years ago, I had a student in one of my preaching classes, was a young single guy, and um, we were going through First Peter, and he happened to sovereignly get assigned this text, and he fought it. He just, Prof, can I have another text? I'm going on the mission field. I don't have any plans to get married, and I don't see the relevance here. I said, hey, just, it's the word of God. Do it anyway, right? Well, he submitted to the process, and I saw him, I'm going to say about eight years later, he was married at that point, and he said, hey, Doc, Thanks for assigning that text to me. That was good preparation for my marriage. It forced me to think through some issues. I feel I was more prepared when I finally got married. So I would like you, if you're in that category as a single, to look at this text because it serves as counseling for marriage by the creator of marriage for perhaps your coming marriage, right? So it's relevant across the board for all of us. Obvious for those of us who are married, it's pretty obvious the relevance here and the question for us is, how are we using our marriages to please God? Do we even think along those lines? It's great to enjoy your marriage, but how can I bless the one who gave me this gift with my marriage, right? It's a great question. I fear today in our culture, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that uh, many people enter marriage with kind of misguided notions. They think that their future spouse is going to solve all their problems and be the end all of they're going to live in some fantasy land. I mean, that it's, it's naive and it's a setup for disappointment because whoever you're going to marry, that's an imperfect person just like you. And sparks are going to fly over time, right? So if you're in a marriage relationship and you can honestly say, we've never had any problems, I already know you just got married about an hour ago. You factor time in there and sparks will fly. In the ultimate sense, no two human beings are ultimately compatible reason I say that, you lock somebody up in a room for three years and they have to cope under the same roof. Everybody's got their idiosyncrasies and one puts the toilet paper this way, one puts it that way, one rolls the toothpaste this way, and we get on each other's nerves, right? We both have sin natures, you know, the porcupines who want to hug and they poke each other and have to back off. That's the sin nature right there. So I'm just being realistic, right? But you can still have a very beautiful and godly and blessed marriage if we follow God's design. So I'm thinking about the wife who was really disgruntled and she went to the marriage counselor and he said, so well, how can I help you? What's the problem? And she said, well, I wanted to marry an ideal. I ended up marrying an ordeal and now I want a new deal. See, she, she wasn't thinking about how can I use my marriage to be a blessing to others and to glorify God because God has created the marriage relationship as, shall I say it this way, a sanctification laboratory. If you want to become more like Jesus, get into that relationship and you're going to have to work it out. Every young couple I know who's gotten married, and they come back to me, you know, because I counsel them, and um, they all go through struggles. It's just normal. It's just the way life is down here, right? It's not a bad thing, it's just the way it is. I mean, we wish it was perfection, but we know this is not heaven. So the way forward is God's way, and that's what I want to explore with you as we ask that question again, when is God pleased with marriage? We're gonna see in this text that God is pleased when both spouses submit to Christ's lordship. And if you believe that, we can go forward.
It's in the Bible, right? So then the question becomes, okay, well, in what ways can both spouses demonstrate their submission to Christ's lordship? Because if we are truly submitted, whether it's the husband or the wife, that should show in some way, right? And so for the wife, here it is, a wife must submit to and obey her husband. Now, we're walking close to the first landmine, so be careful now. We're going to talk about it. And wives, if you're feeling some butterflies, I get it because of what's out there in our culture. But once we understand this text as God intended it to be understood, it's one of the most beautiful things we have on our planet, in my opinion, right? So how do we manifest that submission? Now, for the wives and husbands, we'll get to you in a moment. So hang in there. A wife must submit to and obey her husband. Now, that's raising some questions, I'm sure, but hang in there. Peace, be still. It's going to be okay. Just trust me now, okay? There is a method to my madness. I know I'm a madman, but there's some method here. So look at chapter 3, verse 1. Peter writes, in the same way, so he's keying back. We'll look at that in a moment. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, not a good situation there, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Now, for context, if you want it for your notes, chapter 2, 13 through 17, Peter talks there about submission to civil society, the leaders in society. The idea is submit to them because they're God-ordained. Now, obviously, if they're in sin and want you to do something sinful, you don't have to obey them because there's a superior authority above them. God is the one who raises up and tears down positions, uh, countries, etc. And then if you go a little further into context, 2.18 through 23, there we see submission at the place of employment. Submit to your employer, assuming she or he is within biblical parameters. If they want you to cheat and cheat the customer or whatever, obviously you don't have to submit to that. We never submit to sin, right? We're fighting it in our own lives, and we don't want to submit to anybody else's sin imposed on us either. Then when we come to our text, 3, 1 through 7, now we're looking at submission in the family. So submission, submission, submission. This is the context. This is the theme. Submission is a dirty word in our culture, but it's a sweet word in the Bible. So if we're seeing it negatively, we need to realign our thinking about that whole subject and see it God's way. Now for your notes, we won't go there, but Mark chapter 1, verse 30, there you'll see that Peter had a mother-in-law. Now if Peter had a mother-in-law, what does that say about Peter? He was, begins with an M, he was married. It'd be weird to have a mother-in-law if you're not married, right? We had a strange relationship there. So because he was married, as a married man himself, he's teaching about marriage in the context of personal experience. He knows what he's talking about because he's in that laboratory right now. He's getting his message from God, but he can relate it to his own relationship with his own wife, right? Now, the first landmine, pray for me, I don't want anything to blow up here. Notice that if you study this text, one through six is addressed to wives, and then only verse seven is addressed to husband. What gives, you wives might be wondering? This is an apparent disproportionate focus. Is Peter giving a hard time to the wives? Is he pouring it on a little too heavy? Because they get six verses, the men only get one. Well, it's not a mathematical formula. But the question still stands, why is this the case? Why six verses for the wives and then one for the husbands? I don't know. No, I do know. And here it is. Uh, going back to the first century, wives had a more challenging situation, for sure, than did the husbands, just the way the culture was back then. And in fact, let me quote a scholar. This should help clear it up. In that society, women were expected to follow the religion of their husbands. They, they might have their own cult on the side, but the family religion was that of the husband. In other words, the husband had the prerogative and the wife didn't. The husband had the prerogative to say, hey, get rid of your God and follow my God or gods. And they had all kinds of gods back then, small g, right? And we're going to see this in a moment, but the context here is in this case, the wife is a believer 
and the husband is not a believer. In fact, we'll look at the language later. He seems to be hostile toward the gospel. So she's in a tough situation. Now, how did that happen? It doesn't say. My guess would be that they were married and subsequently she got saved. And now she's in a relationship with her husband and there's some friction because her God is Jesus and his God is whoever, whatever the God might be back, or a number of gods, right? So that's the tension. But notice that Peter is not asking the wives in that context to give up their Christianity for their husband's sake. Because the culture would say, give up your gods, ladies, and let your husband lead with his God, and you submit to his God, whoever that is, right? So you can see Christianity was and is countercultural today, big time, right? And so Peter's not telling her to give up your Christianity so you get along with your husband. In fact, he's affirming her faith in Christ, but he does not want Christian wives to use their Christianity, their freedom in Christ, as basically an excuse to defy their husband's authority. So he's referring here now to a spiritually mixed marriage, Christian wife, pagan husband, right? So keep that in mind. You can say, but I'm not in that situation, but I want you to know that these principles apply to all marriages, and as I say, a lot of them are transferable just in relating one to the other. I mean, in terms of loving your neighbor, in terms of having respect for other people, those are always in season and in style, right? They never go out of style. All right, so look at verse 1 again. In the same way, that's keying back to 2.13, if you want to look there. 2.13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. Remember, under submission to Christ, that's the real bottom line here. Look at the word to. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to, he's always going to tell you who to submit to, in this case, every human institution. Then drop down to verse 18, 218, servants, we could even say employees, be submissive to your masters, to your employer, with all respect. Notice the word to there, right? We come to three one in the same way you wives be submissive, okay, to who? To your own husbands. So there's a linkage, and you know this, to function well, every institution needs a head, and every family needs a final authority, otherwise there's chaos, right? In an emergency situation, you can't have the husband and wife disagreeing. If the house is on fire, the roof's about to collapse, and the wife says, go out that window right now, kids, jump. And the husband says, no, 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 go this way and jump. This is the safer way, jump on. No, this way, no, that way, no, this way. Boom, we're, we're, it's over, right? Somebody has to be the final voice, the final authority. I mean, that's a strong illustration, but the, the principle stands, right? Somebody has to be the bottom line. It's just the way it's set up. So, keeping that in mind then, this is really the question. Uh, and this, I've been asked this quite a bit when, when this kind of a context comes up. And that is, does this mean I got to submit to my husband unquestioningly in every situation? Just yes, sir, yes, sir. Answer begins with an N. It ends with an O. No. Let me qualify. In general, yes, but let me give you the exceptions, right? So if the husband is involved in some kind of sinful behavior or he wants you as a wife perpetuating some sinful behavior, you do not submit. Why? Because you do not submit to sin. If the husband gives you some sinful command, I want you to do this, you know, we're, we lack income streams here, I'm out of work, let's go sell drugs in Wisconsin or something crazy. Yes, sir. No, I can't do that. The wife, and this is where it takes some courage on the wife's part and a lot of faith in her Lord. She needs to look him in the eye and say something like, look, honey, you know I love you. And I'm grateful that God gave you to me. But you know what? God is your creator. I wouldn't even know you if it wasn't for him. And he's the one that put us together. And it's in his presence that we made a covenant one to the other. And as much as I want to submit to you, and I've been trying to submit to you in other areas, in this particular case, the one who created you, my Lord and your Lord, whether you know it or not, if he's an unbeliever, says, do A, you're telling me to do B, you're putting me in a crisis, I've got to either obey you or your creator, I think in this case I'm going to have to obey your creator. And I'm sorry, I still love you, but I just cannot do it. So help me God, right? And, and that's just the way it is. Because 
Jesus always comes first. That's why the point here is submitting to the Lordship of Christ. If a husband and wife are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, that's always going to be the priority. And that helps you to sort out some of these gray areas, should I submit or not, right? So that's the first landmine. Did it go off? We're good. There's four more. Hang in there with me. Tough text. Honestly, this should be a very straightforward text, but again, the culture we're in is saying just the opposite. So we've got some issues to sort out here. So he says, submit to whom? He says, notice, to your own husbands. So this is not a general submission to all men, but it's an exclusive, and marriage is always exclusive, an exclusive submission to the husband, the one husband whom God has given you, right? Why do this? Well, he says, so that even if any of them, any of the husbands, are disobedient to the word, if you have the NIV, it says, do not believe the word. So we have an unbelieving husband who's antagonistic toward the gospel. If you check out the language, it implies he doesn't want her Jesus. So he's not even neutral here. It's a tough situation. By the way, in the first century, more often than not, if there was a mixed marriage, it was usually, generally speaking, the wife who was the Christian and the husband was not, right? Uh, I want you to know, by the way, that these principles uh, do apply beyond even the unequally yoked situation. For example, uh, you might be a strong Christian wife, and your husband may be a Christian, but sort of a deadbeat, lackluster, he needs a little fire, backslidden. These principles still work that way to win him back, if you will, get him back on fire. Again, that's all in God's hands, but there's some things a wife can do. What's the purpose? You see it there in verse 1? that they may be one, literally that they may be gained. This is a missionary term. It means to be won over for Jesus. So what Peter is offering wives, Christian wives, is a divine strategy for winning an unbelieving husband. I would add even for winning a sort of straying, backslidden Christian husband, right? Her motive is the redemptive love of Christ. And this strategy, again, may even revive a backslider, possibly. How should I do this, Lord? I want my husband to come to faith. I want my husband to get on fire. How should I do this? Well, at some point, you need to share the gospel, but I'm assuming in this context here, the wife probably more than once has shared her faith with her husband. So he knows where she stands. He knows that she's under the lordship of Christ and he's her savior, right? But what Peter is trying avoid, uh, to avoid is this. Notice that phrase there, without a word. What he's trying to avoid is a scenario, and this happens once in a while, where the Christian wife starts leaving tracks on the dresser. When he's shaving, there's little stick -em notes with verses on the mirror. He goes into his car, he turns it on, his Christian radio is set perfectly for him, and there's verses, stick -ems all over the car. By the way, before he leaves the house, he has his alphabet cereal, and as he's about to eat it, it says John 3.16, floating right on the, on the top of the milk. Then for lunch, he has his alphabet soup, and it says repent with three exclamation points on it. I mean, that's overkill. And just speaking as a man, men, you know this, after a while, you're going to, it's going to be abrasive. You're going to back off. It's actually diminishing returns. Peter's trying to say, don't take that route, because if you go too far, He's going to resist more and more, and he may just retaliate. The wife may find on her mirror, N-N-N, and on her dresser, N-N-N, and in the kitchen, N-N-N. Honey, what's this N-N-N stuff? Oh, nagging, not necessary. Don't do it. It's not going to work. It's not a good strategy. So that's why he says, without a word, obviously at some point you need to share the gospel. But better, instead of winning him through the ear, win him through his eyes. That's what he's saying. Look at the verse there. By, notice, the behavior, I'm going to add the observable behavior of their wives. Uh, you've heard of Augustine, or maybe you say Augustine, Smith, Smythe, that's your call, St. Augustine, from way back. Uh, there's a section he wrote where he's actually talking to the Lord. It's like a prayer, and he's describing how his godly mother, Monica was the name, who prayed for him and led him to salvation, was married to a pagan husband. Of course, she got saved subsequent to the wedding, probably. And so the man was holding out. His, Augustine's dad, her husband, 
was holding out, didn't want to receive Christ. But how did she win him? Now, here's what he says. He's speaking to the Lord about his saved mom. It, he says this, She served her husband as her master and did all she could to win him for you, speaking to him of you by her words, no, conduct, by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. And so wives, grace-empowered living speaks for itself. In that sense, you don't need words. And he's going to be more impressed with that behavior than even with the notes and the alphabet soup and all the other stuff, right? And so, here it is, verse 2, as they, the husbands, observe your chaste, literally your pure conduct, Christian virtue, purity and lifestyle, your pure or chaste conduct and respectful behavior. Now, if you have the NIV, it uses the word reverence. And that word, the same word, occurs, for example, it's reverence for God. Uh, in 117, conduct yourselves in fear or reverence for God. 217, he says it right there, fear God. And so what's being said, he's not saying worship your husband. No, don't do that. He's a sinner. Worship God and fear him and respect your husband. For your notes, Proverbs. Proverbs 3130. Charm is what? Deceitful. These things that culture puts at the highest. Beauty, you see it on almost every commercial, right? Beauty, the Bible says, is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised, according to God. So what you're going to see here throughout this message as we go through this text is, should I believe the culture? Should I believe God? Culture, God, cult let me roll some dice. No, no. The pagan culture doesn't have God's values. We want to obey the Lord, even if it seems counterculture. In fact, I would argue if it seems counterculture, you're probably on the right track. Our society is so messed up today. If they're applauding it, you're probably doing something wrong. If they're against it, you're probably doing something right. Simpler than that. If the devil loves what you're doing, you're doing something wrong. If he despises what you're doing, you're doing something right. Keep at it. It's that simple. So by their respectful behavior, notice what he says in verse 3. Your adornment must not be merely external braiding, braiding of the hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Braiding of the hair, they're literally plating of hairs. This is the elaborate process of the inweaving of the hair. I used to wear this style. I don't anymore. Have you noticed? No. People started making fun of me, so I stopped it. Uh, so here's a quote. This is from uh, Hebert, his name is. In Peter's day, the hairstyles of fashionable Roman ladies consumed so much time and attention, this is the issue, and were highly artificial and ostentatious. Notice he says there, wearing gold jewelry. In Peter's day, women wore gold hairnets, gold earrings, gold necklaces, gold armbands, gold bracelets, multiple gold rings, gold ankle bracelets. It's a wonder they could walk under all that weight, right? That's all, gold is heavy. And then he says, putting on dresses. This refers to the frequent changing of dresses in order to draw undue attention to self. And so, landmine number two, pray for me. I don't want anything to explode here. Are you saying that women can't wear cosmetics, jewelry, get their hair fixed? Are you saying that? Answer begins with an N, ends with an O. It's no. It's not what he's saying. How do I know that? Well, look what he says here. Putting on dresses. Is Peter against women wearing clothes? Obviously, he's saying wear clothes. So if he's saying you can wear clothes, he's saying you can wear jewelry. So then what is the issue? If I can wear jewelry, what's the problem? Well, in my translation, you may or may not have it. I've got NAS. Verse 3, it says, merely external. Now, that merely is not in the Greek. It's added by the translators to make a point. And the point is that adornment is not being prohibited here. He's saying, you can wear that stuff, but don't just merely focus on that. Where's your focus is the issue. His point is, physical beauty is only skin deep. And ladies, I'm sure you've seen... 
uh, maybe at a distance you see a, a young woman and, and you think to yourself, my, she's pretty. I wish I had her whatever, her hair, her shape, her whatever. And as you go up and approach her, you're meeting her for the first time, thinking she's very beautiful. And as she starts to talk, you start to find out that she's arrogant, condescending, and she curses such a blue streak that the three sailors sitting there are blushing. It's that bad. Now, all of a sudden, she doesn't look so pretty anymore to you. What happened? Her body didn't change. You're starting to see the inner character. I'm using that as an illustration to point out that the beauty comes from within, ultimately. The culture knows nothing about this. All they know is if you got the physical beauty and blah, 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 the right products, right? That's how they see it. But what Peter's talking about is something far deeper. Have you ever seen a woman who loves the Lord who has a glow in her eyes and a radiant smile on her face because she loves Jesus. That's an attractive beauty that transcends the physical, right? And so the pristine beauty of Christ-like character is far more attractive than the fleeting beauty of external vanity. So the question to ask is, do I invest more time looking at the Bible or looking at the mirror? The question is, what is my priority here? And in the case of having a husband who's an unbeliever, do you want him to focus more on you or on Yeshua? Both are good, but the priority goes to Yeshua, Jesus, right? Because we're trying to win this guy, right? But he says, instead of all that uh, makeup, etc., and he's not saying don't use it, but he's saying instead of focusing on that, let it be, verse 4, the hidden person of the heart, that is the inner character, the regenerated nature, the real you, expressing itself with, it says, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. A gentle spirit is evidence of what? Fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience. And so a quiet spirit refers to a tranquil disposition, which sadly is kind of a rare quality today. In other words, the wife should be sort of the thermostat in terms of calmness and peace in the home instead of a crazy wild situation. She can bring tranquility, especially if she's the believer, right, in this context here. So what does God think about all this? We should be concerned about that, right? It says, verse 4, which is precious in the sight of God. Godly character is really the most precious jewel anybody could wear. It's valuable. Outer physical beauty draws attention to self, but inner spiritual beauty draws attention to whom? To the Savior. So his point is, instead of majoring on what you're eventually going to lose, why not major on what you can keep for all eternity, right? Which is that godly character. So he says in verse 5, he's going to give some examples now. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. So he's using these women from the Old Testament as an example, the holy women of old. They expected God to fulfill his promises. Today, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And that's where our focus should be. And it says they used to adorn themselves beyond dresses and jewelry. They would adorn themselves with this gentle and quiet spirit. He adds again from verse 1, same phrase, being submissive to their own husbands. A wife must submit to and obey her own husband. Finally, he gets very specific and gives one example, verse 6. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. In Isaiah 51, 1 and 2, Sarah is portrayed as the mother of all believers. And she refers to her husband as Lord. Uh, Sarah was in the habit of doing so, the language suggests. Now, for your notes, you should write this one down, Genesis 18 and verse 12. We have an example here. It says, and Sarah laughed to herself. What I want you to know here is what we're about to hear is Sarah's inner thoughts. We're entering Sarah's mind and looking through her eyes and looking at her attitude toward her husband unsolicited. This is what Sarah, the mother of all believers, thinks about her husband, Abraham. So again, Genesis 18, 12, and Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I've become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Now, she didn't call Abraham Lord out of obligation, 
out of pressure or trying to impress onlookers. These are her own thoughts. She sees her husband as her Lord. Now give me a moment to unpack that. But my point is she has an inner attitude of respect toward her husband. So we've got landmine number four. Pray for me. Are you trying to tell me I got to call my husband Lord? Answer, and, oh, no. In fact, you would ask your husband, honey, I'll give you an option. Option A, do you want me to call you Lord all the time? Or option B, would you rather have me respect you all the time? I'm pretty sure he's going to go for option B. I don't want to be called Lord. Now, in that culture, here's the point. Well, then why does, he, why does she call Abraham Lord? In that culture, we're talking way back, right? Way back. Old Testament, early Old Testament. That was a sign of respect for her husband. So how do we translate that today? You'll have to figure that out. But all he's saying is, make sure you are showing respect to your husband. So what does that look like? Whatever that is, I don't know, give your husband a back rub if that makes him feel respected, there you go. Whatever works in this culture, right? That's all that is. So don't feel you have to call him Lord, all right? Did we survive that landmine? Whew. Okay, I think we're, we're good. So notice now, and you have become her children through faith in Christ, that conversion. In other words, Sarah's children, if you do what is right. In other words, your behavior toward your husband will demonstrate whether or not you are a daughter of Sarah, the mother of all believers. That will be an evidence that you belong to the Lord, is the shorthand way to say that. And then finally, without being frightened by any fear. Again, in Peter's day, a pagan husband could command his wife, get rid of your God, get rid of your Jesus, and follow Jupiter or Zeus or whoever, right? So there's, there is a little fear element here because he could pressure his wife to conform to his religion, but the believing wife needed to hope in God and take a stand for what is right. This is where we have to have some courage and a lot of faith. That's what wives need to do if they're in that situation. Notice that she's meek already, but biblical meekness is not today's weakness. It's something different. In fact, that involves faith and courage and trust, right? And doing what's right and taking a stand. But when you're willing to cultivate Christ-like character, when you're willing to submit to Christ's lordship, submitting to your husband can be and should be a source of, and I say, when I say great, I mean great, blessing and so many people deprive themselves of this blessing for whatever the reason and God designed it to be a fountain of blessing really and so a wife must submit to and obey her husband now there's a wonderful book maybe you've read it and if you haven't I'd recommend it it's called love and respect the author and if you want it afterwards I'll give it to you again uh, Dr. Emerson Egerich's E-G-G-E-R-I-C-H-S he offers some sound, practical advice for wives with regard to their husbands. And as I say, husbands, hang in there. You're next, so hang in there. Here's what he says, speaking to the wives now. Appreciate his desire to work and achieve. Appreciate his desire to protect and provide. Appreciate his desire to serve and to lead. Appreciate his desire to analyze and counsel. Appreciate his desire for shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder friendship. Appreciate his desire for sexual intimacy. And then Paul adds, and you should write this down, Ephesians 5, 33, the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And so respecting your husband and submitting to his leadership will encourage him in his relationship with Christ and in his relationship with you, and if there's kids involved, with them as well. It's going to make him a better husband, is the idea here, right? And so a wife must submit to and obey her husband. Now let's ask the question one more time. When is God pleased with a marriage? We've seen now that God is pleased when both spouses submit to Christ's lordship. And then we ask the question, all right, if that's the case, in what ways then can both spouses demonstrate their submission to Christ's lordship? With regard to the wives, we've seen that a wife must submit to and obey her husband. Now, guys, it's your turn. How do you demonstrate that? Here we go. A husband must care for and honor his wife. 
A husband must care for and honor his wife. Now, I've noticed we had a whole bunch of themes, uh, of the hymns basically were about love, right? Which is really where we're going with this. So notice verse 7. Even though it's one verse, guys, it's a powerful verse. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hinders. And then now notice verse 7 there, you husbands in the same way. That keys back to those verses. Remember, we'll look real fast again. 2.13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. You see that? 2.18, servants be submissive to your masters with all respect. And then 3.1, in the same way you wives be submissive to your own husbands, etc., etc. And then we come to this verse again, verse 7, you husbands in the same way, it doesn't say submit to, but it's implied that submission is involved. And so submission to who and to what? What's going on here? One scholar puts it like this, husbands must submit to the Lord and demonstrate this submission by meeting their wives' needs. In other words, submit to her needs. She has needs. We're going to see some coming up here, and we got another landmine coming up, so fasten your seatbelts, okay? So what's happening here is Peter, this is something different now. Remember, we had an unbelieving wife speaking to a believing, or I should say a believing wife speaking to an unbelieving husband. Now it's flipped. Uh, who he's addressing here are believing husbands, okay? In the previous scenario, the man was an unbeliever. Now in this case, he is a believer. So Peter's speaking to Christian husbands. He says, live with your wives in an understanding way, literally according to to knowledge. In other words, husbands, educate yourself. Go to school on your wife. Go beyond the bachelor's level and the master's level. Get a couple PhDs. You'll be better off for it, right? Study your wife so that you may gain insight into her nature. And if you think about it, the logic would be something like this. As a husband, how can I possibly care for my wife if I'm oblivious to her needs, her fears, her hopes, her desires? I've been enrolled in the School of Catholicology at least since 1985, but even before then, and I'm still learning, and I'm hoping she's going to grade me on pass-fail instead of A, B, C, D. We'll find out. But still working on it. It's my, probably my favorite subject. And so, guys, hello. If you want to love your wife, you better know what's going on inside and what her needs are, what her desires are. And by the way, he's not saying study every wife out there. He's saying study the wife that God gave specifically to you. Be attentive, be kind. A husband must care for and honor his wife. And there's a lot of blessing there. It's a great delight. The culture is not doing this, friends. And that's why there's divorce and fallout, etc., you see a strong marriage, generally speaking, they are following these principles right here. So how should I do this? He says, as with a weaker vessel. Oh my, another landmine coming up here. Pray for me. It might explode. I hope not. Are you trying to say that wives are weaker spiritually, morally, intellectually? Answer, because with an N, no. This is referring to the physical, right? Generally speaking, generally speaking, a man is stronger than a woman, generally speaking. I can prove that a lot of different ways. So, for example, uh, you know what's happening today in the culture. If you are a biological male, but you identify as a female, you can enter female track meets. And when the gun goes off, boom, within seconds, this big, tall guy is like so many meters ahead of the, the short ladies here, right? And they have to take two strides to equal his one stride, and he wins all the contests, he gets the scholarships, and hooray, right? You're saying that's wrong. It is wrong. The man generally is stronger than the woman. Are there exceptions? Well, if you would have known Big Belinda, who I knew in second grade, I saw her take down two boys out in the playground. Nobody messed with Big Belinda. I was afraid of her, so were my buddies. So there are exceptions. But would we agree, generally speaking, men are stronger? 
And that's what he's referring to here. And so he's saying, husbands, don't overpower your wives. Rather, protect your wives. That's your job. Lay down your life. In fact, write it down, gentlemen. Uh, Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives. How? Tall order now. Just as Christ also loved the church. Wow. I can't do that. I know you can't. But Christ can do that through you because he's living in you, right? Otherwise, why do we have the command? And he gave himself up for her. We, without thinking, gentlemen, should be able to lay down our lives for our wives in a dire situation without even a thought because we love them that much. And so a husband must care for and honor his wife. There's more. It says, and grant her honor. Husband, use your God-given authority to bestow honor upon your wife. And that'll be shown basically by how you treat her, your attitude toward her, etc. You see, your wife is a woman of great worth and dignity. She's a precious co-heir with you, right? You both belong to Jesus. He created both of you. She's made in God's image just like you. And so when you're alone, do you treat her with loving esteem? When you're in public, do you treat her with respect and honor. Um, I don't want to get off on a hobby horse, but it's always bothered me when I hear guys pretty much putting down their wives when she's not there, and she can't do this and she can't do that. That's sin. But it's, not only that, it's tacky, and then I start wondering, if she's got all these flaws, hey, dummy, why did you marry her if she's that bad? Really? Can't be. Never do that. Always have something honorable to say about your wife public and private, both and. and. So a husband must care for and honor his wife. And here it is, as a fellow heir of the grace of life. See that in verse 7 there? Now, uh, Paul, teaching about justification by faith, for your notes, in Galatians 3, 28-29, listen to what he says, Galatians 3, 28-29. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, in other words, at the foot of the cross, for you all are one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And so Christian spouses both enjoy equal standing before God. It's just the way it is. Husbands and wives are equal in dignity, equal in worth. Now, by contrast, what does the world say? Just the opposite, right? Uh, you know, you have worth based upon your role, based upon your function, based upon your credentials, based upon your prestige, and whatever. Status. Now, God gave them different roles, but he values husbands and wives equally. Now, husbands, this should send a little chill down your spine. Notice what he says, verse 7. So that your, that is you husbands, so that your prayers may not be hindered by whom? By God. Literally, in the Greek, to cut in, to interrupt. Now, how many remember what's called a telephone booth? Anybody remember that? Believe it or not, I know a bunch of people that don't even know what a telephone booth is. Of course, they're not around too much anymore. But if you ever watched Superman, didn't he change in the telephone booth? Am I right? So you should know that anyway. But I, I can remember back in the day, I think way back, I think it was 10 cents to make a call. You put your money in the machine. You go in this booth, right? Make your phone call. Dial and talk to your friend or whoever. And then I think it went up to 25 cents. And you had so many minutes, I forget how many, but if you started getting near the end of your minutes, the operator cut in, right? 25 cents, please, for the next five minutes, or whatever it was, right? So imagine God saying, I want you to care for and honor your wife, please, for the next 50, 60, 70 years. Otherwise, your prayers get disconnected. I don't want that, do you? And so what that tells me is there is a relationship between my wife and how I relate to her and how I relate to God. If my relationship with my wife is strained, it's also strained with him. And so guys, if your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, a good first place to start, I mean, it could be something else, right? But a good first diagnostic is how's my relationship with my wife? If it's messed up, maybe that's why your prayers are bouncing right back down and God will not hear them. That's sobering, isn't it? And so a husband must care for and honor his wife. Now back to that book, Love and Respect, he also gives some advice for husbands with regard to their wives. And here's what he says. She wants you 
to be close. She wants you to open up to her. Then he says, don't try to fix her, just listen. Guys, we're doers, we're fixers, right? As soon as there's a problem, I'm on it. Just listen. Yeah, but that's hard. Well, wait a minute. Fruit of the Spirit, among other things, is patience, self-control. Hello. Then he says, she wants you to say, get ready, guys, write it down. I'm sorry. She needs to know you're committed. She wants you to honor and cherish her. Now, that's biblical. Let me give you a verse, gentlemen. Uh, Ephesians 5, 28, 29. So husbands, it's for the guys now, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. This is a wise thing to do. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but notice nourishes, and there's the word, cherishes it. Cherish your wife, nourish her, just as Christ also does the church. So the, the standard for the husband is Christ. It's a lofty standard, but apparently it's doable. Otherwise, he's really taunting us by giving us a command we cannot fulfill. I'm thinking we can fulfill it by his grace and by his spirit working in us as we're submitted to the lordship of Jesus. So when is God pleased with a marriage? Well, God is pleased when both spouses are submitted to Christ's lordship. In the book, The Meaning of Marriage, Kathy Keller, wife of Pastor Tim Keller, you may have heard of him, a famous pastor on the East Coast, she gives an example of submission in a very tough life situation. As you know, some decisions are tough. And in the flesh, it's easy to shirk our responsibilities. I don't want to make that decision because if it blows up in my face, then I get called on the carpet. So I'll let somebody else, let Charlie do it, not me, right? So listen to what she says here. This is really fascinating. I want you to try and enter into this situation and see it from both sides, husband and wife. And it's very instructive. In the late 1980s, our family was comfortably situated in a very livable suburb of Philadelphia, where Tim held a full-time position as professor. Then he got an offer to move to New York City to plant a new church. Tim was excited about the idea. But I was appalled. Raising our three wild boys in Manhattan was unthinkable. Not only that, but almost no one who knew anything about Manhattan thought that the project would be successful. I also knew that this would not be something that Tim would be able to do as a nine to five job. It would absorb the whole family and nearly all of our time. It was clear to me that Tim wanted to take the call, but I had serious doubts that it was the right choice. I expressed my strong doubts to Tim who responded, well, if you don't want to go, then we won't go. However, I replied, oh, no, you don't. You aren't putting this decision on me. That's abdication. If you think this is the right thing to do, then exercise your leadership and make a choice. It's your job to break this logjam. It's my job to wrestle with God until I can joyfully support your call. Tim made a decision to come to New York City and plant Redeemer Presbyterian Church, which now is a very large church. The whole family, my sons included, consider it one of the most truly manly things Tim ever did because he was quite scared, but he felt a call from God. Now, I want you to listen to the pronouns because this is the essence of marriage. Marriage, if it's anything, it's a team effort. And I hear too many young couples with me versus you, you versus me. Before we get married, I'm going to keep my money in this bank account separate from you, and you're going to keep your stuff over here in case this business arrangement doesn't work out. We can go our separate ways. Hello, that's not marriage. At best, that's a business relationship. It's for life, my friends. It's a covenant before God. You got problems, you work it out. Factor him in, but work it out, or get counseling or whatever, but you never give up. 
Now, there's exceptions. I know there's some tough stuff out there, uh, abuse, etc. but I'm referring to the, the average uh, marriage, basically. Here's what she says. At that point, Tim and I were both, I love the word, submitting to roles that we were not perfectly comfortable with, but it is clear that God worked in us and through us, and we accepted our gender roles as a gift from the designer of our hearts. That's not bad. You see, God is pleased when both spouses submit to Christ's lordship. If that's working well, the rest takes care of itself. This is generally the problem, submitting to Christ, because it's me. I'm going to be an opera singer for a moment. Me, 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 me. That probably wasn't in key, I'm sorry. But that's how it goes. Well, what about me? I'm entering this thing. I married you so you could do this, this, and this for me. I've got all these standards for you, and you're not meeting them. Well, I married you for this, this, and this, and I've got all these standards, and you're not meeting them either. I feel let down. This was false advertising. I want out. Really? You're not understanding what marriage is about. You're in a laboratory of sanctification where you're working on yourself, guys, and she's working on herself, right? That's what it's about, factoring the Holy Spirit in the mix. And some awesome things happen. Uh, wow, I got so many stories I could share, but you've probably been in a restaurant, you've seen an older couple who have been married for, let's say, 55 years, 60 years. And there's the young couples checking their phones, not even looking at each other, not even saying a word to each other. And here's this old couple just looking each other in the eye, holding each other's hands. And the man reaches and touches his wife's hands. And there's, she would say there's probably 10,000 words in that touch because they know each other. They can read each other. They've been through hell and back through all those years of ups and downs. They've stayed together no matter what. And they've got something that you can't put a price tag on and you can't manufacture it. You just got to go through life together. And it's so precious. I don't have words to describe it. I love this person right here more than I ever have in my life. And it gets sweeter. Honey, does it get sweeter every year? We've been through some stuff, right? But it gets sweeter every year because we hung in there. Oh, yeah, there's days you want to give up. This is going wrong, that, but you hang in there. It's amazing what difference one day will make. And never forget that whatever you're facing, as tough as it is, this too shall pass. We've got a brilliant future ahead because we're under the Lordship of Christ who has infinite, limitless love for each of us. We don't deserve it. So don't try to earn it. You can't. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But his love is stubborn in the best sense of the word. And we should have some of that with regard to each other, spouse. A stubborn love that's not going to give up, no matter what. Submitting to the Lord, Jesus, submitting to him is what it's all about. Let's speak to him in prayer, shall we? We want to thank you, Lord, for this. Only you could have thought up this beautiful thing called marriage. And, Lord, it saddens us to see how the culture is graffitiing it and trying to redefine it and just distorting it beyond recognition. And yet still, we see those dear ones who choose to follow your ways and your will and do it, quote-unquote, the right way as they submit to your Lordship, Lord Jesus. I pray for each one here, whether we're married or not, that we would embrace these relationship principles such as mutual respect and love and concern and compassion and kindness and literally all the fruit of the spirit being manifested in the midst of that relationship we want you to be in the middle of all of our relationships lord and let there be less of self and more of our savior and so lord in the days ahead work in our hearts in our minds so that we might be in full surrender to you and willing to put others first as you did, Lord, you were selfless and sacrificial. Help us to be such by your grace, by your spirit, by your power. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus and all my special friends said, amen. Praise the Lord.